Welcome to The Foundry, where leaders are forged daily. Each week we investigate themes of leadership, entrepreneurship, and mindset with some of the greatest minds in real estate. And now, the data scientist of real estate, George Roberts. Welcome back investors in this second exciting segment of Calvin Roberts on holistic real estate management, best practices and strategy. We will cover more pitfalls. You don't want to fall into such as not understanding coinsurance, as well as not understanding the difference between actual cash value policies versus policies written on the replacement cost. And as always, if you'd like to invest passively in real estate and enjoy all the benefits of real estate without having to deal with tenants, termites, and tantrums, come find me at www.horizonmultifamily.com and set up a meeting. I'd love to talk. And with that, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Well, let's talk about some pitfalls of insurance. So we don't all have your encyclopedic knowledge of insurance, Kelvin. So help us out, help us mere mortals out to understand what are some of the things that you think people are not understanding and getting hurt on? Like, for example, co-insurance. I think this is a simple thing, but until you understand it, you could find out that your payout is actually a lot of you thought. No, absolutely. I wouldn't argue that co-insurance penalty is probably the most common error that we prevent and fix. And I'll give an example of what that is and what that means. Insurance companies with their infinite wisdom and you know, seemingly never-ending supply of gotcha type plays that they have, they've written into just about every property insurance contract what's called the co-insurance clause. And what that means is we are required to insure to value a minimum percent most commonly 80%. That's what I see the majority of the time, but it could be 90%, could be 100%, could be 0%. You know, they waive the co-insurance. But 80 is kind of the standard, what you'll see on the majority of commercial property policies. They reduce our claim settlement proportional to the amount that we're underinsured. So 400,000 is 50% of the minimum, 800,000. Let's say that we have a $300,000 fire, but well, we would expect to get $300,000 minus our deductible, right? Wrong. We would, in this scenario, get a check for 50% of $300,000 minus our deductible. So you're looking at a check for one fifty dollars less whichever deductible we have on policy, maybe five or 10000 So in that scenario, let's say you get a check for a buck forty, you have $300,000 worth of damage that you need to repair. You now have to come out of the pocket 160000 to cover that pit bull. So that's where not buying adequate insurance or working with someone who doesn't necessarily run around in the real estate segment actively. You know, maybe they are kind of a generalist type insurance broker and just write a lot of a bunch of different segments and don't try to specialize. It's one of the most common errors that I see on policies. And that's the reason why. You know, I'll ask people, can I see your deck page? Because I can usually compete on rate, the cost per $100 in coverage. But if someone is writing a policy the wrong way, giving you substantially less coverage, you know, lower limits than the minimum we need to have on the policy, you won't see that anything is wrong until the claim happens. But at the same time, the premium that you're paying will typically be below market rate artificially. You know, it's not very hard to kind of game the insurance application process. If I want to produce a lower premium for a new client I'm working with, there are ways that you can do that, but it doesn't do the client, you know, a fair service. You're setting people up for failure. That's why I think it's the wrong approach. It's the number one thing I sell on is fixing the insurance to value. I read another statistic in the last year that 75% of commercial real estate is underinsured by 40% or more. And based on my anecdotal experience, it's about right on the money. 
Yeah, well, here's another thing that gets people not understanding the difference between an ACV or actual cash value policy versus replacement cost. So help us understand what's the difference and how can you get caught out by that? Actual cash value in a total loss scenario, you know, building burns to the ground or otherwise exhausts the limits on policy, it will behave one-to-one -one with replacement costs. They'll cut you a check for the policy limit less your deductible. Where actual cash value shows, you know, kind of rears its ugly head is those small to small medium and medium plus type losses where depreciation comes into the picture. So on a replacement cost policy, let's say you have a policy limit of a million dollars and you suffer a loss for 500,000. That's what it'll cost to repair or replace the affected property. You're gonna get a check for 500,000 less your deductible. Let's say on another policy, we have actual cash value loss settlement. And we again, incur that $500,000 cost to repair a loss. Let's say it's a older building, you know, maybe it was built in the 20s, 40s, 50s, even 60s, 70s. It's depreciated a substantial amount. And the way that depreciation is figured by the insurance company is the percent of the functional life that remains. You know, some actuary counting beans somewhere with their infinite knowledge has decided this frame wooden building constructed in 1940. We believe it'll have a functional life of, I don't know, 100 years. And let's say at the time of the loss, the functional age of the building is 50 years. You know, the functional age would be the year of construction while also waiting updates to the property proportionally. Let's say the building has depreciated 50% to this scenario. If you have 500,000 cost to repair or replace, damage to the property and the building has depreciated 50%, you're looking at a check for 250,000 minus your deductible, maybe 10 grand. So in that scenario, you're looking at the claim settlement check for approximately 240 to repair 500,000 worth of damage. I joke that actual cash value is essentially half insurance because that's a pretty good rule of thumb. You know, you're looking at substantially less insurance coverage. And the recommendation I usually make is go with replacement cost coverage, but then increase the deductible on the policy to get the premium where you need it to be. That gets you a, a known stop loss amount, whereas actual cash value is essentially a percent deductible. You know, deductible, that's a percentage of the loss where the exact percent is not known until the loss happens and it will continue to scale proportional with the loss. So the bigger the loss, the more we incur of the loss out of pocket. I believe that replacement cost with a higher deductible is safer and more logically consistent risk accounting. And that's why I recommend going that direction. You know, I had one where it was approximately 200 Detroit apartment units. So I, I have a scenario where it's 200 Detroit apartment units. And prior to myself taking on the account, it had been actual cash value with basic form cause of loss coverage. So instead of being a all peril policy, it only covers for 14 specifically named, fairly common causes of loss, but not all inclusive, you know, nothing like a, a first pipe or sprinkler system, especially like we had with that widespread freeze event, late 2022, that was a great time. <laughs> he had a $2,500 deductible. I wrote replacement cost coverage with a $25,000 deductible, order of magnitude greater. My rationale being on the small, so small mid-size type of loss, you're gonna feel more out of pocket pain, but it's a known amount that you can budget and account for. And this client is someone who has never filed an insurance claim. He tries to avoid filing an insurance claim for all but the most serious fire, you know, a catastrophic type of loss scenario. 
So he wasn't necessarily opposed to going with a higher deductible. My rationale is that on the medium to medium plus losses, you're paying substantially less out of pocket. I mean, I'm talking tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, less out of pocket because you're not getting charged a percent of the loss from the depreciated value. So on a you know 1925 Detroit apartment building, that might have depreciated 70%. You could be paying a substantial portion of the loss out of pocket, even for a small to mid-size type of loss. But I believe that my approach is a better approach from a sound risk accounting perspective because it's difficult to build sufficient reserves for kind of a question mark loss amount. Whereas with replacement cost coverage with a $25,000 deductible, we can account for that increased cost of deductible risk, set money aside each month and build a you know, reserve nest egg. So it functions as kind of a stop loss mechanism. Yeah, I love it. And it also plays to your own personal approach to insurance. I know I don't like to file no. claims. Then my premiums go up. Then my loss run uh, that I got to show to the next insurer is, is not good. So yeah, it makes perfect sense, particularly if you're the sort of person that doesn't like to, to file the claims, have that higher uh, higher threshold and just know you know, you know what it's going to be <laughs> if something goes wrong. Well, here's another thing that a lot of people I think are getting hit by, maybe not a lot of people, but when it hits, I think that it's it's very unexpected. I just went to a conference and there was a major syndicator who mentioned that he'd gotten hit by a ransomware cyber attack. Mm -hmm. Now that's something separate, right? That's not a peril that's going to be covered in, in your ordinary policy. You've got to go, I believe, generally quote that separately, correct? Correct. Yes, sir. The way I typically tackle cyber, where you see the cyber exposure for residential investment real estate is the property management operation. So for a you know, syndicator or any other type of real estate investor who owns but also manages their own properties, I encourage forming a separate entity for the management exposure. And then you just write a fairly, you know, off the shelf property management insurance policy and include that cyber liability coverage. I did that for one in Michigan earlier this year where they had concern because they're very much at scale and know the perils of, you know, ransomware or a nefarious party, you know, infecting their computers or their employees' computer with a virus and then potentially stealing money from them or from their property owners. We wrote a cyber liability policy and we wrote in tandem with that a crime insurance policy you know, to cover that act of theft of others' money in the form of financial theft. I believe both are a very good idea. Are they particularly common? They're becoming more common. So well, it's something to where Will you probably get hit by a ransomware attack this year? Hopefully not. But do I put my money where my mouth is and buy cyber liability coverage for Falcon? Absolutely. I think it's money well spent. Yeah, nice, nice. So let's go to the personal level. You mentioned that one of your greatest strengths is having an outside the box insurance strategy. Mm -hmm. So please describe. So we, we throw spaghetti at the wall for our clients. And I, I say that extreme confidence. I, I have one case where it's 195 units in Southeast Michigan. It's a fairly vanilla apartment complex to where I could usually get a Travelers or a State Auto or any of the other kind of common players on a small to mid-sized apartment complex to hop on this. What makes this case special and challenging is that the largest building is 49,000 square feet. It's non sprinkler And the insurance company is thinking, okay, well, if that building burns to the ground. So if that building were to burn to the ground, which the insurance company underwriting this account is thinking 
maybe there's a 1% chance of that happening any given year. They're thinking, okay, well, we're going to have to cut a $10 million check if that were to occur. Historically, into the last two, three years, placing an account like this with just one insurance company wouldn't have been that challenging. I mean, a little regional out of Michigan called Hastings Mutual, they were the previous incumbent insurance provider. They were the insurance company who underwrote this account three or four years ago. But because of the continued hardening of the market, you have to involve several insurance companies with what's called a layered approach. So company A pays up to the first $5 million. Company B pays the next 5 million. Company C pays the next 10 million after that. And you can just keep sticking on additional layers with additional insurance companies until you get the limits that you need. That's the approach that you have to take for multifamily portfolios in Florida, for example, to build sufficient wing capacity at scale. It's too much exposure for any one company. You have to bring multiple players and run them in sequential order to get the job done. So that's pretty applicable case example of how we do things differently. We don't get frustrated and give up and go out on the deal just because we can't find one insurance company to take on a complex account or complex portfolio. Build the program that you need from scratch. I mean, you know, it becomes negotiating sometimes in tandem with three to five plus insurance company underwriters, coordinating them, hammering out the details of who takes what to get that result. Yeah, well, that approach, you always seem to find something, Kellen, and you never seem to stop until you do. So that's that's good stuff. I know we talked a lot about insurance horror stories already. But do you have any other stories that you'd like to share? Somebody who didn't know uh, the danger they were in because maybe they didn't have the right coverage. So I have one. It's a 140-door multifamily operator in Beaumont, Texas. Current client of mine who I've been working with now for just under two years. And during the Texas freeze catastrophic false event, I think in 2021 or 2020 when you know, mob Texas lost power, resulted in first pipes from freezing throughout many properties in Texas. His limits on the policy were far below the minimum suggested and allowed to comply with the co-insurance clause. And when we had our initial phone, you know, appointment to kind of talk through the account, talk through losses and so forth, he told me that he felt like he got hosed by the insurance company he had been with before. It was about you know, $35,000 worth of damage. He had a $10,000 deductible and he received a check for $15,000. But that's strange. That's it's not right. Well, two things were working against him there. The first being he had the actual cash value loss settlement. So that reduced a portion of the payable claim amount. And the second being is that he was below the minimum 80% for the actual cash value, more than, you know, for each building on the policy. So he got hit by not just depreciation from ACB, but also that go insurance penalty. And the incumbent broker he had been working with previously either didn't understand this or didn't care enough to talk through and explain why he's receiving a smaller than expected insurance claim settlement offer, you know, was just kind of left in the dark. So that's it's a good real world example of even on the small to medium size losses, insurance can get you if you're not working with someone who actively plays around in this segment all day, every day. You know, it's kind of the same reason I personally don't go after you know, big battery manufacturers or tire manufacturers or big doctor's office chains. I'm not knowledgeable in those segments. I previously, I worked construction for a couple summers for my, you know, my paternal grandfather's uh, residential framing company when I was a teenager and very young adult. So I had an innate understanding of building construction styles and just overall found that that experience translated very closely into what I'm doing now. 
going after the real estate segment. It's what I'm knowledgeable on, feel confident with, and have experience on. So it, it comes down to it's better to be a specialist and know one or two things extraordinarily well, better than others, than try to do a little bit of everything all over horribly. Love it, sage advice. So, hey, with that, I think I'd like to head into the rapid fire round. Calvin, are you ready? Let's do it. All right. <laughs> So if you could be known for only one thing, what would that be? Commitment. What's the greatest lesson in leadership you learned as an entrepreneur? Listen more than you talk. What is the personal characteristic that has been most pivotal to your success? Frustrated determination. I will see it through to completion. I know it. All right, so let's ask one random question. Just one. Mm -hmm. Tell me when to stop cutting the deck. Stop. All right. What is your favorite part of Thanksgiving dinner? Ooh. The mashed potatoes and gravy. All right, good answer. <laughs> All right, I think we're going to get a lot of head nods out there in the audience. Uh, name a book that's helped to forge you as a leader and as an entrepreneur, and why? Ooh, so I have a curveball answer here. I am a very big music and hip hop fan, and when I was a pretty young adult, I read the Gucci Mane autobiography, front to back. I mean, I popped a squat, read through it for like six and a half hours straight, think it up until the book was done, and it taught me a lot about doing things differently, taking a guerrilla approach to compete with much larger, entrenched, established players who have greater financial resources than myself, and persevering through difficult odds to get the outcome that you want. What's the biggest hurdle that you have overcome in your business in the last year, and what did it teach you? I would say the biggest hurdle that we've overcome comes down to communicating incessantly with my team members. You know, I initially had taken too much of a, how do I phrase this, not hands-off, but just a trusting relationship with my team. And they do a great job. I mean, they're committed and dedicated and, you know, it's a bunch of Young hungry go getters is who I try to pick up. Go figure. But if some, <laughs> it, it's just if someone doesn't necessarily have the same level of experience I do, you have to monitor and set controls to make sure that things are not just getting done, but getting done to my standard. And that's something that we've really put significant emphasis into building those systems to make sure that rather than get something done satisfactorily to someone else's standard or, you know, holding the ball higher is kind of what I'm going for there. Standing. Can you give us a quote to help forge our listeners as leaders and entrepreneurs? Speak soft and carry a big stick. I think that's a good one. Okay. Classic. <laughs> and now if people want to reach out to Calvin Roberts, how do they do that? Email works perfect, Kelvin at falconinsagency.com or via phone, 734-887-9110 or LinkedIn, Facebook, pretty much any method that you feel comfortable with. Carrier pigeon, smoke signal, I'll see it and I'll be there. All right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking your time to share your knowledge and experience with our audience. Oh, no, thank you very much for hosting me once again. It's my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.